Greetings, friends. I see a few of us are logged on here. Been live for a few minutes, and uh, Varsha Bonsal will be joining us at the bottom of the hour. Glad that you joined us. Going to get started tonight by reviewing a little bit of the information that that uh, inspired me to contact Martha and and ask her if she would be on the show and help us to understand a number of aspects of the economy from a, a different cultural perspective than we have and also to share with us the reporting that she's done on the gig economy and on workers in India that take those jobs, they are typically of a lower caste. They don't have access to the education and financial advantages and work opportunities and social opportunities that are afforded to some of the other uh, people in their community. So uh, that is tragedy, to be sure. It is also something that I believe is, is not going to uh, be and isn't unique to India. Uh, I know from friends that work in Silicon Valley and, and many other people that I've met uh, in Silicon Valley that the caste system of India uh, has made its way to Silicon Valley and that that still holds in social settings and workplaces in the high tech sector, uh, which, is, which is fascinating because you would think that in a new culture, in a company where, where people are somewhat... Uh, peers in terms of title at least that that would would no longer be material but it seems to be what we're seeing in the united states we've always been used to lower caste we've been used to farm workers migrant laborers that work longer hours with less work protections than anyone else uh, there's been other immigrants and classes and refugees and workers throughout the history of the United States, also slaves, that have toiled in very difficult conditions, uh, sometimes in impossible conditions, and yet they've, they've persevered through this time. Well, now we're in a position where what was once thought of as employment, what was once thought of as a job, is now a transactional fraudulent corporate AI system that uses human labor by the minute, that fractionalizes a human life and a human mind and a human uh, presence into something much less than human. Uh, that's a red flag for all of us. So I wanna uh, go ahead and just, just take a moment here to to go through the work that we're going to talk to Varsha about. And uh, we will be a little bit more brief when she comes on. Uh, gig workers are being stabbed, stoned, and abused in India. An Uber driver was mugged. An Ola driver, that's another uh, competing gig economy company in India, was beaten and left in a coma. Platform workers say tech companies are doing little to protect them. Again, a commonality with the United States. We're seeing violence uh, across the gig economy. Uh, and there's a reason for that. The gig economy is, is broken by design. It's dysfunctional. It's gaslighting. It's abusive. It's exploitative. And because of that, the human behavior that, that attempts to survive in that system, it takes on uh, those, those attributes well, you can't beat a rigged, gamified, gamblified system by playing fairly. So there are people that will take other opportunities. Now, uh, 
that leaves gig workers who are allegedly unaffiliated with the corporate AI shell that tasks them with labor, and it leaves them alone and isolated and uh, socially picked upon by this system. And so it's, it's, it's just another way to codify what already exists in many parts of the world that has always existed in the United States, which is that uh, we have classes of people, immigrants, women, people that are, that are uh, darker color skin, uh, people that have criminal backgrounds or criminal records or have even been uh, charged with criminal offenses but have not been convicted. We limit their abilities to work. And so the gig economy is going to take that and is going to use that to predate upon them further. And, and I would say the gig economy is kind of the ultimate realization of the corporate psychopath. It's the ultimate realization of pure exploitation without uh, any investment or even any contact with the workers. Uh, one night at around 2 a.m. this past January, Uber driver... Priyanka Devi was on her way to pick up a passenger in the Kashmiri Gate area in Delhi. While she awaited for the passenger, a brick came through her car window. Two men attacked her, trying to grab her phone and demanding she hand over the keys. But she resisted. One of them slashed her neck with a broken beer bottle. The men fled when a passerby approached, taking with them her day's earnings and leaving Devi, 31, bleeding by the roadside. Devi, as she tried to call, uh, Devi said she tried to call Uber and used an SOS button in her car. I called them, parentheses, Uber, and parentheses, so many times, she says. They responded to me a few days later, only after this incident made it to the local news. Uh, that's also a commonality with the gig economy companies in the U.S., uh, you can never talk to them, but sometimes if, if the right agency talks to, talks to them or sends them a message, uh, a little bit of resolution comes. Uber India spokesman Ratika Tomar says that they reached out to Debbie as soon as they were made aware of the incident. The Uber app has an quote, in-app emergency button through which the driver can directly call local police, end quote, Tomar says. Adding that Uber's records don't say don't show uh, Debbie didn't use it after her attack. So this is another uh, this is another absurdity that some application that cares nothing for you and exploits you gives you a button uh, that's allegedly to to help you in an emergency rather than than other emergency services. Uh, window dressing, this is corporate whitewashing. This is pretending that you are offering uh, some modicum of safety to uh, labor when you're not offering anything at all. And DoorDash and Uber and these other uh, companies did this as well. Uh, these are very hazardous jobs. Just delivery is a hazardous job. One out of five Amazon delivery drivers, company trained in a company van, had uh, injury accidents on the job in 2021. Extrapolate that to the gig economy uh, around the world, in the United States and in India, that's not a good thing. One week after Devi was attacked, Mohammed Ritzwan, a 23-year-old in Hyderabad, was attacked by a customer's pet dog while delivering a food order for delivery platform Twiggy. To save himself, Ritzwan jumped from a third-floor balcony. He was taken to the hospital but died a few days later. In the same city, Y. Venkatesh, a driver for the Ola Ride Hailing Service, has been in a coma since last year after being beaten by the friend of a passenger who refused to pay his fare. Just this month, platform drivers complained about being harassed and even assaulted by security staff at Mumbai Airport in western part of India. Drivers in the East Indian city of Bawati uh, filed complaints of being robbed by fraudsters posing as customers. And in a gruesome incident down south, a customer allegedly killed a delivery agent when he couldn't pay for the iPhone he ordered online. Reports said he kept the corpse with him for at least three days before disposing of it. How grisly. 
Gig work in India is dangerous. A review of the local news reports across the country shows at least a dozen such attacks over the past few months. Wired spoke to 50 people working for ride hailing and food delivery services. Roughly half of them said they have been attacked on the job because customers refuse to pay, others because they're caste or religion. The numbers reflect a rising trend of violence against the platform workers in India. The Center for Internet and Society, a think tank, surveyed 1,500 gig workers last year and found that one in three said they fear theft or physical assault at work. For one in three people while going to work featuring that they might be robbed today or face physical assault is alarmingly high, Ayush Ratai, research lead at CIS, says. While instances of rogue customer behavior and carjacking are common in the U.S. and other countries, the power imbalances in Indian society, the class and caste divides, create a potentially toxic environment for platform workers. The gig workforce in India has expanded rapidly in recent years. NITI AAYOG, the Indian government's public policy think tank, estimates that there may be more than 23 million gig workers in the country by 2030 three times the number at the start of the decade. The growth of this cohort who lack stable jobs, social protection, and access to collective bargaining in, uh, intersects with India's other social fractures, exacerbating the precarity and disempowerment. That's pretty profound stuff. And, and I'm going to uh, end our reading there, the article uh, will be in the notes and and we'll get a lot more detail from Barsha. Let's read that last part again. The growth of this cohort lacks stable jobs, social protections, and access to collective bargaining intersects with India's other social fractures, exacerbating their precarity and disempowerment. That's no different than in the United States. That's no different in 26 other countries, including India, that DoorDash operates in. Uh, this is what characterizes the gig economy. It's human exploitation. And to see that from uh, Varsha's standpoint, from another culture, from a culture that already has culture, has uh, social divides, that's going to be very profound. Uh, America has social divides, and I think America forgets that other people in the world face similar problems and deal with them as well. So I, I think there's a lot to learn by looking at other parts of the world. So Marcia should be with us any moment. She emailed me a short while ago, and uh, we will. Look forward to introducing her. She uh, wrote for Wired, and then Varsha also has quite a uh, a resume of accomplishments, including uh, the Pulitzer Center, where she uh, is a grantee and AI fellow uh, there at the Pulitzer Center. So. That is pretty darn impressive. So here's Varsha, Pulitzer Center, an independent tech reporter based in Bangalore, India. As life becomes more and more online, she is curious about the intended and unintended consequences technology and the internet can have on people. She is a regular contributor with Wired alongside having written for Time, MIT Technology Review, Slate, Rest of World, Al Jazeera, The Caravan, and more. Prior to this, she worked with two of India's biggest business newspapers, Economic Times and Livament to capture the growing tech ecosystem in India. Varsha Bonsal holds a master's degree from Georgetown University. She will be using the AI Accountability Fellowship to understand the impact uh, AI has on gig workers in India. 
What could be more important than that? Not much. So with uh, no further ado, look who's joined us just on cue. Hello, Varsha. It is my great pleasure to uh, meet you finally. Hi, Jeff. How are you? Let's see. Do we have your audio? Yeah. Let's see. Can you hear me? It could be it could be me. You know what? I bet you it's me because I've just been sitting here yakking to myself and I my ear my headphones became unplugged. Yes. Uh, so oh. hold on. Check. Check. Can you hear check. Me now? I can. I can hear you better now. There's no echo. Oh, I had sm such a smooth intro for you. I'm gonna I'm gonna cut that and pretend it never happened because I was <laughs> just when I read your I read your your wonderful uh, CV and what your goals are, and uh, I'm I'm highly intrigued and and I thank you for for taking the time to get up early in the morning your time, uh, kind of in the night our time. Uh, hello, from, <laughs> hello from the other side of the world. Tell us about yourself. I I shared a bit of your article. I shared your uh, profile. So uh, share with the audience what your work is. Uh, take as long as you want to just kind of take us through your journey through the gig economy, through AI. Uh, and isn't that great? AI and the gig economy are like, boy, are they linked, aren't they? So welcome, Varsha. And uh this is the Full Dash Closure audiobook and podcast, episode number 17. Welcome, Varsha Bonsal. Great. Thank you so much, Jeff. That was really lovely. And yeah, it's a bit early here, but uh, but but thanks to you, I'm up, I'm up early, so that's great. Um, a little bit about myself. I am Varsha Bansal. I am a freelance journalist from India. I'm based in Bangalore, uh, but it didn't start out this way. I was in... Washington DC uh, at Georgetown University, <clears throat> getting my master's degree in journalism. And I had no clue I was gonna come back home and start writing about tech. So in 2016, I, by 2016, I had worked for a, one company and I decided to come back home. And when I came back, <clears throat> I realized that a lot has changed in India in the last three years that I was away. It looked like um, technology was being proliferated across you know, different regions. I mean, I, has, I had used Uber when I was in DC, but I did not know that my dad uses Uber in India. So that was interesting to me when I came back. Um, if I wanted to order something, if I wanted to eat something, I was craving for something from my favorite restaurant. I didn't need to go there. All I had to do was tap a few buttons on my phone and there was something called Swiggy or Zomato and we could just order food to our doorstep. So all of that just was so fascinating and so different for someone who never experienced that, you know, sitting out of home, uh, my hometown, uh, I was I was intrigued. And uh, at the same time, I got a job at Economic Times. It's a, it's a business daily in India. And I was asked to write about technology and startups. But the whole focus at that point was around the business of technology. So I wrote about different companies coming in, different kinds of founders, what kind of unique ideas they had. Uh, I spent a few years doing that, but as I reported on the business of technology, I realized that there was something more important going on, uh, which is the other side, how people are being impacted by technology. So that, that's when, you know, you see gig workers coming in, you see a lot of um, labor and other kinds of people who are impacted by this you know, extremely new unknown thing that India was experiencing. You had internet, you had smartphones, and you had different kinds of jobs or different kinds of, you know, services coming in and people did not know how to react. People also enjoyed the fact that they could make more money through the internet or through these apps. So I moved on to the other side and I started writing more about how people were being impacted by the proliferation of smartphones, technology and the internet. And uh, in 2020, in the middle of the pandemic, um, you know, that was probably one of the more intense times when technology was being used even more. And I somehow felt the need to quit my job <laughs> and start freelancing and write more about what is happening in India for a global audience. So I have been doing that for three, four years now where 
I spend all my time understanding how people are impacted by technology in India and write that for international publications for a global audience to get insights from the ground. And in that process, I have been regularly writing for Wired, MIT Tech Review, Slate, and many other publications. And it's been a fantastic experience because I see editors being really interested in understanding what's going on. And I'm able to tell the story of people from the ground here uh, through their own voices. So I think, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's been a, a very fulfilling experience so far. Wonderful. What, so you, you uh, attended Georgetown University that's here in the United States in the Washington DC area. And uh, so you've spent time here. What would you tell our audience? We do have audience in, I think, over 20 countries now. But what would you tell our, our American and, and Western audience about how cultural differences in India dovetail and, 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 and fit together with the gig economy? Because you think India's, uh, I am no expert, and unfortunately, I've never been there yet. But everything I've read and, and studied about the India's about India's caste system tells me it's it's one of the more uh, fixed and and long standing caste systems that are still in place in the world today. So uh, I'll just go back a little bit in time and give you some context on the Indian caste system. It's 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 a it's a hierarchical system established in the Hindu uh, religion, which basically divides people into four uh, Hindus into four categories, where you have Brahmins at the top, and then you have uh, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas, and Shudras. These are four different categories amongst which people are divided. There is also a fifth category called the Dalits, which uh, meant they were also called untouchables, though untouchability legally was abolished in 1950. Uh, it still persists in some parts of the country in direct or indirect ways, it, in, in smaller parts, in hinterlands, you know, things like that. So what has happened is people who work, people who have been doing menial jobs or, you know, have been menial laborers have mostly been from the lower caste. And I think in India, what has played out is uh, people who were doing this unorganized work have started working as gig workers. You know, they found another way to make money where they could still not be associated or be permanently employed, but have this gig work. Just a minute, my laptop. Sorry. Oh, no worries. So I, I'll, uh, I'll vamp while you're taking your life. So, so when what you said is is so analogous to the united states though because america's always had a direct uh labor force for physical labor for low wage labor for factory labor for farm labor uh that's always been a part of america but it's uh it's kind of rotated different immigrant classes have come in over time and and been you know, when, when at one time there was Irish immigrants that were working in the factories and were a lower caste in their society. And then there was Italian immigrants and then there was Jewish immigrants, my family that came in and they were a lower mm -hmm. caste. So that's kind of been a rotating thing in America. Now, this is this is codified in, in a religion. That's got to be really difficult. How does I mean, how does that shape up? You're born to a family and no matter what you do, there's a certain social status in society that you're going to have, whether you like it or not. I've even heard again that people, I, I told the audience uh, people here in San Jose have clearly told me that, that in San Jose and here in Oregon in the high tech sector, that the caste system is still in place and, and a look across a boardroom from one to another uh, can, can do damage. And that's, that's really wild. I mean, that's something I think, again, we're, we're used to bias in America. We're not used to uh, to it being so culturally codified. Yeah, um, it is culturally codified. That's uh, that's a great term. I'm going to I'm going to steal that. But um, also, I think, yeah, it, it is codified in the, the family you're born into. And then even um, in your last name, right, if you have if someone so usually people will ask for your last name or which neighborhood you live in to really figure out what social class or what caste you sort of belong to. I have been lucky enough that it hasn't happened with me. 
but i have heard too many stories of you know people experiencing this on a regular basis so um, same yeah. thing uh, same uh, sorry so same thing plays out with gig workers where you know uh, you have um, customers feeling a little entitled in the way they treat gig workers so i spoke to this muslim delivery boy uh, delivery guy who's from bangalore and he used to work full time with this food delivery app called swiggy and he mus- he's muslim and he told me that uh, a lot of the times because of his name many people would just treat him differently the minute they saw him or the minute they saw the name they wouldn't want to take the food directly from him so they would ask him to leave it outside so i again i don't know how deep rooted or prevalent this is but i've heard stories that this has happened he hasn't been thankfully he wasn't abused but he definitely was not treated the right way and a lot of these things made him rethink his his position as a gig worker with swiggy and now he only works part time with them so i feel like a lot of the gig workers have decided that they they start as a full time thing where they could spend 10 to 12 hours working on the platform but now they've divided their time between something else and you know working on these platform platforms for some extra cash so so um, yeah so it sounds like there's a little bit different when i when i read your article it often talked about uh the fact that that customers didn't want to pay uh, are there are the, is it typical in india that customers are paying upon the delivery as opposed to before delivery as is common in the united states so there's actually a transaction the the, the gig worker in india actually has to collect some money Yes that's correct so india has something called cash on delivery until until a few years ago in fact india was a heavy cash economy where most of the transactions took place using cash in fact when e-commerce companies started in india maybe a decade ago that was one of the challenges or the problems they had to solve for where you know indians did not trust transacting on the internet and they wanted to order something and then pay once they see the product being delivered to them that is when the concept of cash on delivery came up so in fact in india with uber or with food delivery or even with e-commerce any kind of e-commerce you still have an option of cash on delivery uh, though the cash economy has changed a little bit now and everyone uses different credit cards or upi or you know qr code payments that still exists so that is what um, has happened for many years where miscreants would just order something and they wouldn't pay up when they would get the product and the gig worker was at the receiving end because they you know they are dealing with a faceless system so it's not like they yes. can call their employee and talk to them so it's a very tricky situation for a delivery worker especially if it's late at night you are also you know carrying money that's another risk that you're taking and if someone doesn't give you money then who do you blame because the cost you know it's it's just it's a very he said she said situation so yeah the gig workers are stuck in a rock and hard place that have um, in one of the instances that i mentioned in my article um i it's it's a it's a gruesome incident in a part of bangalore where a customer stabbed a delivery worker because they refused to deliver the iphone um or the iphone was late i'm not sure what what it was but there have been instances where there have been physical abuse either because of the delivery was late or if they didn't want to pay so yeah it's it is a bit challenging so there has also been a lot of tabloid style incidents dramatic incidents whether they be violent uh gig workers have been kidnapped and murdered uh yep. an uber driver uh you know doordash had a kidnapping while somebody was had their children in a car while delivering i mean there's there's been all kinds of of mayhem what it what seems to be common between what you're describing in the united states is that the gig economy has also found a way to alienate consumers and gig workers from each other here and and they've done that by deception and by gamification and gamification uh with with hiding tips and changing payments and providing deceptive and incomplete information so that you know, every contract is fraud they're 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 skipping 
they're, they're not providing known material information every time they send an offer to a gig worker because it's about manipulating them in a, in a gamed uh, rigged simulation, not about a, a market with any type of fair processes. So um, what has happened here is, is that it's taken all the focus off the gig companies because uh, people love to look at the lower class or lower caste of gig workers and say they should be better. They who receive no support, who take all the risk for a global corporation, who have no training, no insurance, uh, provide their own transportation and take all the time, wage, uh, inflation risk and all other risks for a global corporation, uh, they're always the ones that pay. Now, the, the, the unique thing is that through all of that, where do consumers and uh, who are being gouged for prices and and not seeing true market options in a polluted market of this rigged gig app, where do they turn their their ire? They turn it on each other. And and you, you said that kind of the key thing. So DoorDash came along during the pandemic in the unique uh, way. How did it slip past? all of the regulators and government officials in India that, you know, as a business person, I would say something that is clearly a fraudulent business model. If somebody brought this to me in investment, I would tell them that they're an unethical uh, monster and they should never be in business, never to call me again. So how did this model that's so clearly in my mind, naked fraud, uh, make it, past make it past the goalie if you will you guys have you guys have sports with goalies too we got sports how did this one make it past the goalie in your country because it made us past the goalie in our country nobody looked there are no rules there was never any rules set up for this so the only rule for the gig economy is there are no rules in fact these companies other than being a shell for corporate ai for all intents and purposes don't exist you can't talk to them they don't know anybody that does operational field work they're they're a shell for corporate ai that is that's ex exploitative. I'm going to read something and then I'm going to uh, pass it to you. So this is a uh, this is a tweet. Share my my screen here for a second. Uh, here we go. Share. There we go. Okay. So uh, in India, about 47% of gig workers are involved in medium-skilled jobs, nearly 22% in high jobs, and close to 31% in low-skilled jobs. Trends show, dot, 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 concentration of workers with medium skills is graduating, gradually declining. Demand for low-skilled and high-skilled workers is increasing. So it sounds like America, like the middle class is, uh, is disappearing. Now... Uh, according, uh, right above this, according to a recent NITI AOG report, 7.7 .7 million workers were engaged in the gig economy during 2021 uh, and 2020, constituting 2.6% of the non-agricultural workforce and 1.5% of the total workforce in India, with the gig economy projected to continue its explosive growth. So the government's into it. Just like in the United States, I mean, they spend hundreds of millions of dollars lobbying politicians and even the alleged liberal politicians veto anything that comes down to attempting to regulate the gig economy. Now, of course, I know they'd fail anyway because you can't regulate uh, <laughs> a rigged game world. But nevertheless, whenever anybody tries, they get batted down. So uh, who is bought off in India? I, I don't know who's bought off in India. Okay, so I, I should I I shouldn't put you on this spot. That was a joke. I, I'm not <laughs> implying. I don't know India. I'm not going to get far. Who in India um, could or should look at this and protect workers potentially? So I'll first start off with uh, the lay of the land with respect to laws in India for gig workers. So there are two things that have happened that that are at least on paper monumental. 
where you've had uh, so until 2020 there was absolutely no protection or inclusion of gig workers in any kind of law with respect to health security labor benefits or you know collective bargaining and things like that but in 2020 the social security code came up which included a definition of a gig worker which meant that the platform workers were finally included in social security to to achieve to to get social security benefits to get health insurance and all of that through the government again it's on paper we don't know how things are playing out uh you know on the ground and the second major milestone that happened was earlier this year a state in india called rajasthan uh proposed launching an act for you know the welfare of gig workers and also carving out a big fund of worth rupees 200 crore for gig workers welfare again that's was proposed and it's on paper, but that that was considered to be a big milestone for gig workers in India, at least in Rajasthan, because that's one state that uh, did something for gig workers. But other than that, there is no law that really protects gig workers, and that has been problematic. Uh, there are unions that have been forming slowly and protesting and talking to, you know, individuals in the government to do something about it so they are very active now where they are asking the government to take action we don't know where it is going to go but that is the situation uh, right now companies also offer insurance and other benefits on paper but from all the conversations that i've had with gig workers none of it actually helps them i mean it, it i'm sure it helps some of them but majority of gig workers end up running from pillar to post to be able to claim insurance and they are buried in paperwork and yeah, that's, are that, that's very much what what uh sergio avidian uh described for prop 22 in california which was written by the gig economy corporate uh cabal uh who wrote the laws in india i assume uh the 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 helpful app colonizers from around the world helped write those laws? Um, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Leading, I was leading the witness. I apologize again. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get you in trouble. You're, uh, I'm just a guy. You're a real reporter. I don't want to get you in trouble. So, um, when you look at the future, and you look at what is what is projected as the growth of the gig economy. Is this uh, what's your view of it as as a business with uh, the ability to to last for any period of time versus maybe a crash and burn scenario? Do you see the gig economy um, as as gig apps and as corporate AI and manipulating the, the people as they do today, do you see them continuing to be successful in India? Is that, you know, I know it's, it's efficient. That's a, that's a great question and a lot to think about here. So one is, I don't know at this point, how sustainable is the entire business model? Considering everything that has been going on over the last few years, including what's happening right now, where gig workers are constantly protesting against low wages, against being squeezed, against working 24 hours and not getting paid for their work. So I don't know how sustainable it is, especially at a time when there is pressure on tech companies to deliver you know, profits or show strong numbers. That said, I don't know if this is... I don't know if this is going to eliminate the whole concept of gig work. I don't think that's going to happen because there is, at the end of the day, uh, an unemployment issue in India. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you need to make the money. You need to put bread on your table. And if there are no other employment opportunities, people are going to continue working for these platforms. They may find some of them are fortunate enough to find a balance where they can work at different places and also just work here part time or find a different job altogether, but there are many others who can't or who don't have any other options. And this still gives them more money. So uh, I don't know if there's a crash and burn situation. It is definitely un not sustainable, but uh, you know, 
hopefully things will change in the next few years because i think now everyone's taking notice everyone's talking about it when these companies launched a decade ago it was so new no one knew what's going on and i feel like these conversations that we have and other other articles that are being written i'm hoping will make government take notice and do something about it yeah do what are the other competing uh, opportunities for gig laborers in india what are the other things that they could do if what are, what are the what are the scopes cuz i i think in the united states there is a one of the reasons the gig economy is popular uh, amongst gig workers despite the gaslighting and abuse and lack of protections and everything else is that they were so dissatisfied with their full-time jobs with the uh, employment that they had with the supervisors they had with the hours and respect they received with their co-workers there there have been so many issues around lower wage work and how miserable that is in other conditions um and and I happen to uh, have have done gig work myself during the during the pandemic, and you know when there when there is uh, only really really awful alternatives, you know maybe gig work seems like a lesser evil for a while. I found out because of the risk involved that even what seems to be profitable is is a very slippery slope, and it's it's more of a trap because when you're covering all the risk and all the expenses. Uh, things go wrong. There's a reason the gig economy, uh, corporate cabal, doesn't want any of the business risk and would love for all the poor people of the world to have it. It's uh, it's bad for business. And so when 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 these when these uh, lower castes and gig economy workers get all the risk, it's only a downhill slide. So how, I mean, how, wh what are the other things they can do? I mean, I know from watching uh documentary films you know there are people at lower castes that are picking uh metals out of trash there are people doing all different kinds of things that i don't think we experience uh right now in america maybe we'll get there um what people can do i mean i'll focus more on what people used to do and then moved on to gig work so one category of people would be who were in smaller towns and villages and they were into farming so i know that you know some parts that have you know again climate change playing its role and there uh, the you know farming getting impacted a lot of them had to move to a bigger city and start driving for uber or you know start the, the farms the farms shut down or the farms couldn't pay their wages what uh, i don't think they were able to just uh, you know grow uh, they, I think they had they had a lack of water and they couldn't really farm. So so you know droughts and things like that. So those kinds of issues played out. That's a smaller portion, but that is one example. Mm -hmm. Another is a lot of these um, workers have been in construction. So that's another uh, category. And sub strangely, this is from my reporting. What I saw that a lot of them used to work at hospitals mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, you know, like a lot of, there's a lot of maintenance and janitorial and and assisting and things like that. Yeah. Yes. So um, many of them and a lot of the women also. I mean, it's not like there are too many women in gig work, at least who are driving or delivering food. But, uh, you know, the woman I spoke to for my article who was attacked uh, when she was driving for Uber, she used to work at a hospital and now she's going to go back working there again because she feels safer, you know, with gig work you're just a lot more precarious and prone to getting attacked or any kind of crime that would otherwise exist but you are there so it just becomes more you know you become more prone to it so that's interesting are... so so in the in the US the demographics that the that we're given is uh over over half of gig workers are women it's it's oh. uh it, the majority are women and people uh of, of color so um, that's that's interesting. So in India, because of the because of of your culture, it's mostly men in gig work there. Is oh, that... yeah. In when it comes to uh, driving cabs or delivering food, it, it is mostly men. 
but then you also have this other company called the urban company which provides at home services which okay. could be ranging from electricians plumbers to salon services at home so because they provide salon services for women that actually has a lot of women in their gig work uh, so that's know, a that's that's a gig work is is kind of a personal assistant at home gig work huh yes yes and what, yeah, what, that's is, a, you know, what is that company work. called urban company urban and so that's i mean that's what we're seeing in the u.s too i wrote a piece i haven't followed up on it but i wrote a piece a few uh months ago there was somebody who wanted to start up a, a gig company for traveling nurses so you know that so it's, i mean it's it's not an original idea anymore is it that that we use technology to dispatch people but the difference between dispatching uh travel nurses and dispatching last mile food delivery is is vast uh you know travel nurses are not anonymous or not anonymous people they they have uh a lot to do with that independent contract just like plumbers and other people do the, the challenge with the gig economy of course is that there is um there's nothing sticky about it it's totally a transitory uh yeah activity in the united states one of the things a term that i coined um that applies that applies globally is called labor laundering and just just like uh money laundering obscures the sources and uses yeah. of money for the purposes of organized crime the the gig economy is extraordinarily good at uh the crime yet 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 to be uh, prosecuted and defined crime of labor laundering they obscure the sources and uses of labor in the united states a person could work uh can can earn up to six hundred dollars uh in a year from any given gig company there's a lot of them right without having any reporting to the irs from either the company or from them so in, in essence they don't exist so uh that if you multiply that out by gig economy companies who love short timers, right? They make profit. The more turnover there is, the less experienced people there are, the shorter they're on the platform. They just make a killing on that. So, yeah. uh, so we see this dynamic it, that, you know, first of all, the more experience any worker has, the less valuable they are for corporate AI. Corporate AI wants somebody that executes directions like a robot and that has no feelings and no thoughts and just just clicks the button and and that's the ultimate that's the ultimate goal of of what they're of what they're trying to do here so yeah. uh what, what are your thoughts yeah no i agree with the with the part you mentioned that they would love the quick turnover and the more experienced you are the less valuable you are to the platform i've so, seen that so, so for labor laundering, I mean, it, what are the rules in India? Are they are they having to report their labor I mean, it, in their 10K financial reports? If you look at any of the gig economies in the United States that are that are public companies, they subtract out uh, all of the aspects of of their uh, gig worker labor force prior to reporting net income. So, so the actual amounts and hours and people and transactions completely and totally unknown for these. And, and when you combine that with who these guys are and, and uh, I want to ask you about, about the actual AI in just a minute, uh, that is a terrifying, terrifying scenario because it's, it's just set up for literally nothing but abuse. Yeah, when you say 10K, is that for private companies or public companies? That's for public companies. So in their annual reports, so for example, DoorDash, if they they, they have their annual report, when you look at their, it, it should, dashers are not on the DoorDash annual report. They don't exist, which is amazing, right? I mean, yeah. never in the history of the world has there been a global corporation more scrupulously distanced from the people that actually do the labor task. It's amazing. I mean, it's some kind of it's some kind of evil magic. I have, I have no. Yeah, doubt. yeah, um, no, I agree because um, they are technically that's the that's the garb under which they cover it, right? That they are technically not employees. Mm -hmm. The challenge here is that most of the companies that I'm covering, um, except Zomato, which recently got listed, these are all 
private companies, the local ones in India, they haven't gone public because they're still not as big as the ones in the US, um, I guess. So, but whatever financial documents I have seen, it's it's not uh, it's not mentioned anywhere as you know because again they're not employees, so it's not directly mentioned in any of the documents that at least I have seen. But as they go public, they probably may have more disclosures to be made than as a private company. Right. So fr from from an AI perspective, so you, you have a background, actually, in artificial intelligence even before the gig economy, right? Um, I don't directly have. I mean, I've not studied artificial intelligence, but I have been writing about artificial intelligence since before AI became a big, a very common term to be used now, thanks to ChatGPT, I guess. But uh, yeah, I have been writing about the way AI impacts people for a, a few years, starting with surveillance. So, and so, so one of the one of the really unique aspects of of this is that corporate AI has the ability to completely uh, obscure reality. It's like threading reality through the eye of a needle. And then what's on the other side is this little sliver that you're getting from DoorDash. And, and that's kind of in the nature of these apps and, and these, right? Everybody has a, a mobile device, a phone. And because of that, they have the ability to scalably control people by the thousands, by the hundreds of thousands, by the millions, or either globally. And, and so I talked to somebody uh, in the Silicon Valley this week that is uh, an expert on user experience. And mm -hmm. they talked about a term called dark patterns. Do you know what dark patterns are? Um, no, tell me. <laughs> okay, I will, because it's, it's, it's very relevant to this. And I think, um, well, I'm going to kind of break this story, but I'll, I'll tell it to you. So dark patterns are design elements in a user experience that either dead end or trick or deceive or exploit a user in a legitimate company that is not operating on the basis of fraud, if a user experience designer was to find a dark pattern in the application or in the software, they would go to their, to their manager and say, oh my gosh, I found a dark pattern and we fix it. Now, in the gig economy, you've got companies that are built on dark patterns. Mm -hmm. This is a, a very, very dirty secret because uh, if you know what they're doing, uh, I mean, the people that I've talked to in the Silicon Valley that know what they're doing, that are in the industry, um, that know people personally, say that it's like uh, it's people that have chosen to go down the path of pure evil, that that uh, dark patterns are designed in. And, and again, we know this because they're, they, they don't even need dark patterns. They're they're just committing complete fraud by omitting material information that they have from every individual contract. Th th that in alone. But but this concept of dark patterns, you know. So an example of a dark pattern would be, you know, a click wrap agreement that has to scroll down twenty five pages on a mobile device or on a computer, and you know nobody's ever going to go through that. So that's a dark pattern. A dark pattern would be something like. Uh, DoorDash used to do this thing where they'd switch the order of the buttons instead of they'd put the red button for exit instead of the red button for go forward. So when they wanted you to accidentally log yourself off, they'd switch the color of the buttons. And if you're driving and trying to pay attention to multiple things and you press accept, all of a sudden you just locked yourself, you just knocked yourself off. So DoorDash wow. did stuff like that all the time. It's it's one of the most it's ridiculous. Well, this is this is why I be say became so uh, completely fascinated is that I knew that this this thing was just absolutely bamboozling people. And then, you know, once I really got into AI and I've been studying this and working on this project for the last year, uh, you know, I literally screamed out loud in horror virtually daily because, again, what, what they're doing 
is so obviously illegal, so obviously wrong, so obviously inhuman, so obviously exploitive, and and they're taking it around the world and nobody's stopping them. And who's yeah. behind it? SoftBank with Saudi Arabian money and Chinese investments. That's who's behind Uber and DoorDash and, and many others. Nobody good. Absolutely nobody good. And so that's that's what I've really and, and I'm working on this dark pattern story because I, I got a I had a two hour conversation with a, with an insider from the industry. But uh, to hear that, it's it's everything that I already knew. It's it's yeah. the fact that there is nobody working at DoorDash that doesn't know they're doing evil. I'm going to say that again, because I know people from DoorDash watch uh, this and listen. And I, you know, the jig is up. There is nobody that works at DoorDash that's in design, that's in marketing, that's in any function that doesn't know that it's a scam and isn't taking the opportunity to make themselves wealthy at the expense of humanity. That's who works at DoorDash. So pretty ugly right yeah um the the button thing is new for me i've heard of a lot of dark patterns as we call them but uh, i had not heard of this switching the colors of the buttons you know in a way for wanting them to exit the app but uh, yeah right. that and, is and so that's that's just one example i mean other examples were were intentionally misleading the user with 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 uh sequences um the clicking for you know click here for the free offer and the, and misleading and incomplete information um one of the things doordash does and and you know that is my specialty if you will i've focused on doordash there are countless versions of the app going at any one time and in any instance on any poor sucker's phone, uh, oh, I was getting here. Here's this would be my instance on my phone, which will you know never be fired up again. But on any given instance on a on a poor sucker's phone, uh, DoorDash has the the opportunity to to. Uh, individually play them as a as a market of one they're going to exploit every mental uh, vulnerability every past order vulnerability every acceptance every decline and the the fact that is that these companies have psych psychiatrists and psychologists and mental health people that that scrupulously work with people to plan out these apps to gaslight to coerce to uh to force if you will people to take money losing and unprofitable offers and i came up with a term that some people thought it was controversial i don't even think it's it's controversial uh i call it app slavery and I call them app slaves because they are. There is no independence from corporate AI. You, can, you don't have independence in Mario Kart. You can choose the yellow cart, the red cart, the green cart. You can race. You can win. You can even talk to your friends on the phone and pretend you're and be in the real world. It's nothing you do is organic, right? And that's 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 DoorDash. In fact, when you look at the architectural design of these silos, right? The whole point of apps is that. There's an app here for the gig workers and 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 uh, and you know that they call dashers. That app does not have any connectivity to the consumer app, other than than one little thread that that allows them to to temporarily be in contact with each other. Neither of yeah. those has any thread with the restaurant. So it's all this siloed information that allows DoorDash uh, to to use their algorithm with over 2 million predictions a second to, to, uh, to put out what's going to do next. They can slow the system down. They can speed the system up. They can increase wait times. They can slow down wait times. They are the omnipotent gods of a uh, rigged game world that's using people in 27 countries. So that's, I mean, that's, that's the absolute fact, right? There's no, 
and and this is the thing like there's not even any like kind of gray areas where somebody could go well i don't know maybe they're okay you know again so what when you look at that picture do you do you see something that i don't have you seen a different a different part of this that you see in either india or in other countries that that maybe is more positive than i'm putting it out to be um I don't know if it's more positive, but I can tell you some interesting stories about how gig workers might be battling these dark patterns. So I actually wrote an article about it last year where um, gig workers here have become more aware of the algorithmic patterns that push them to do certain things or push the, or, you know, or mess their wage or there is the wage discrimination or mess up their incentive amounts and things like that. So they have, all of them, a lot of these people over here have been trying to work on different systems to understand how they are being discriminated based on wage, based on, uh, you know, they, they claim to give surge pricing, but they actually don't end up giving them any surge pricing. They, you know, have these app, these uh, push notifications where they direct you in a certain neighborhood because they want more drivers there, thinking that they're going to get surge pricing, but they don't. So I feel like now... So, so these things, these things that you're talking about, these are artifacts of a simulation. They're not real. In fact, one of the things Sergio Avidian and the rideshare guy have showed many times, I talked about it as well on their show. If you had two gig workers with their phones next to each other, they're going to have potentially different offers, different surges, different, different interfaces, this chaos, right? These, these different versions for every instant, different programs, constantly changing. This is purposeful. This is yeah. purposeful because with this chaos of a gig app in a rigged gig app and a rigged game world, nobody, no human can ever get a bead on how this thing actually works. 15, yeah. 15 merchants and 15 drivers has 15 factorial different ways to deliver. That's over a trillion. That's 15 wow. times 14 times 13 times 12 times 11 times 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, right? That's over a trillion. So anybody that thinks that they're going to figure out uh, the way that DoorDash is dispatching drivers is deluding themselves. Nobody has any idea how long DoorDash holds an order before they send it out or how they decide who to send things to or how they how they incentivize or de disincentivize people of different uh, different pricing tolerances. I mean, all of these things are, are rigged in addition to the fact they control at all times, both the supply and the demand for labor. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so everything that's happening there, any human control that anybody could ever perceive or any anthropomorphization, you know, humanization of this system anybody could ever have is an illusion. And, and so, you know, it, this is, this is the period, the, the title of my book is, is full dash closure awakening from the human exploitation of DoorDash singularity. And I believe this is the singularity. And the reason yeah. it's the singularity is because the majority of humans on the planet Earth that are doing these jobs don't know that they're being deceived, don't know that they're being gamblified. Uh, that's a term from gamblification is a term from Dina, Vina Dubal, who will be on the show here in a few weeks. She's a brilliant uh, legal mind, one of the foremost uh, about labor and the gig economy in the United States. So she wrote a paper on gamblification, uh, yeah. also known as algorithmic wage discrimination. Right. So that means that for any reason or no reason, they can pay me less than you or you less than me for the same job. And who knows? Nobody. Right? This is this is why it's labor laundering. There's no records. There's no standards. There's no hours. There's no wages. There's no capital investment. Right. This is this is asset free, uh, asset free corporatocracy. I mean, I know it's yeah. a dream world for billionaires. For everybody else, it sounds like living hell. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I know about that paper by, by Veena Dubal um, on wage discrimination because I have been researching on that myself because there are lots of uh, gig workers I've spoken to who've said that everyone's search pricing is really different and they've noticed that as they move closer to getting their search pricing, you know, the incentive, they stop getting orders. There are so many of these things playing out where 
multiple of them are waiting at an airport to get a ride but then you see that everyone else around you around you gets it so there is discrimination being done no one knows how it works but the good thing right now with gig workers is that they are becoming more and more aware i don't know where what that will lead to right. but there is awareness that is being created and that's the first step and on a slightly more positive uh, note there is um, you know gojek in indonesia and may, I, i don't know if you've uh, read about this but there are gig workers over there who've created these um, apps that sort of deceive the gojek app where you know they can change their location or they can change mm, yes 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 we're seeing a lot of that too we're seeing third party applications that help to manage this so so this is this is kind of a joke though right to have a aggregation app that aggregates what's been purposely disaggregated because that's yeah. that's what gig apps are right they disaggregate markets and customers and consumers and labor they disaggregate everything so and then these apps attempt to put it back together again with or without their permission uh para app i was on with david uh pickerell the ceo of para app uh on their on their podcast and he talked about that he was in the new york times because jordash was literally breaking his his uh application specific uh interface on a daily basis oh um, Well yeah so they you know these companies look this is this is a deep conspiracy this is the first real entree of corporate ai into the world of managing and controlling humans on a mass scale and it's working and it's terrifying and yeah. and you know the the what scares me is this this uh, bias towards status quo you no know, it's here Well, let's make the best of it. And I say, right. well, it's here, maybe we should burn it with fire. <laughs> and 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 start hiring people and have real jobs again because they don't think this is a legitimate way to to hire humans. They don't. And I don't think humans can survive it most most importantly because one of the things we've seen here in the United States, uh it's been going on long enough, especially since the pandemic, is that it's a race to the bottom. The wages keep going down, the standards yeah. keep going down. Now we say the now we see the the gig economy companies advertising for workers that are brown kids on bikes because they they don't even want to afford to pay somebody in a car to deliver these things anymore they're losing money on every order right so why is it being subsidized yeah. that's the question that's that's definitely the question because i think a few years ago when uber had launched many of the drivers in india migrated from smaller town and villages to bigger city took a loan bought a car and started driving for uber and the local competitor ola and then the wages started going down and they couldn't pay back their loans and many of them actually took their own lives because of this entire scenario so that was really extreme which happened i think that's horrific years ago. i'm sorry that's that's terrific so horrific. yeah so that was something really terrible that happened and that's a direct result of you know as you call the race to the bottom wages going down because a lot of these gig workers decided that okay now it was a way for them to move up the you know it, it was a way for them to have social mobility move up the ladder but um you know you assume that you're going to be getting a certain amount of wages you get a better life you start putting your children in better schools you think they will be educated and have a better job and then a few years or even months into it you realize that you're actually not going to be making as much money yeah and, and, know- and so what what i found in addition to that in addition to the fact that it's a pretty well known thing and and my my contacts in silicon valley also confirmed that look doordash can tune up and and uber they can tune up anybody they want to have a uh, better performance or worse performance and when newbies come on they want them to have a good feeling and have some good yeah. days and get addicted to to earning money and then it all starts to go downhill uh from there and so the, you know this is this either bait and switch or this um you know start them high and then uh get them addicted that also goes for for consumers by the way they want addicted habituated consumers you know that's that's the the goal and that's even the goal of the gamification and gamification is that 
they want to make being an app slave fun. They want to make it, you know, they want to play on people's pride and desire to earn money. But the question is, do they actually earn money? So what I found was that by the time I was, uh, was done with 5,521 DoorDash deliveries, that's a lot, right? Uh, by, wow. the time, by the time I was done with 5,521 DoorDash deliveries over a couple year period in three different states in the United States, um, I had uh, done about $8,000 of damage to my car, including significant maintenance. And my coup de grace of my, of my gig app career was on a hot day in Bloomington, Indiana, when my uh, timing belt and water pump uh, blew up. So that was not only a $2,000 repair, but there was nobody in the small town of Bloomington, Indiana, that uh, could fix my car in the next month after that. So I owed now $2,000 to a mechanic that I couldn't really afford. And I was without work for four weeks. Uh, and I had nobody to even start to fix my car. That was a lot of fun. So, you know, that that depression or that, you know, what might make somebody really despondent. I've been there and I was there at the end of my two years of gig working. That's why I tell people it's a trap. You think you're getting ahead, but the expenses and the risk catch up with you. I mean, there's a reason I think I said before you came on um, that one out of every five Amazon delivery drivers in the United States was injured on the job in 2021. One of out, out of every five was injured on the job. So if you extrapolate that to gig workers worldwide who have no training, no safety, no OSHA, no, no occupational help, no insurance, um, that, is, that is a horrible, horrible fate. Risk alone, and I've said this many times, risk alone negates any potential positive from the gig economy because it's corporations, global corporations transferring the risk to the poorest people in the world. That's absurd. So I want to show um, something right here. Um, I've also been corresponding a little bit with uh, Agni Ghosh, who's a fan of yours uh, as well. She wrote an article, and I want to show it to you, but I also just love the title. If you have an enemy, then buy them a car. Gig workers, gig workers versus multinational corporations in India by Agni Ghosh. Uh, and that's in logicmag.io, L-O-G-I-C-M-A-G.io. Um, it's a really interesting article. And I kind of been saying the same thing. Friends don't let friends work in the gig economy. Uh, have, have you seen Agni's article about if you have an enemy, then buy them a car? Or what, what do you think of that title? Yeah, the title is great. It's uh, definitely very catchy and makes you want to want, want to read the article. But uh, yeah, so I, I I haven't read the entire article because I was out traveling last week. But um, I think I, I think it really uh, sums up the situation very well. I don't know about uh, you know friends not letting friends work uh, <laughs> as gig workers, but I think uh, yes, if you're a good friend, then you wouldn't want your friend to be a gig worker because uh, it's a lot of it's 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 not great you know especially and i think whatever you said about uh, gig workers i think it's a universal issue that is playing out here in every country and and something definitely needs to be done about this problem so are there are there many uh gig corporations competing in India. I mean, in the United States, it's become pretty much a monopoly for a very few, right? Grubhub is hanging on by the skin of its teeth. Lyft is hanging on by the skin of its teeth. Yeah. Uh, DoorDash, DoorDash owns 65% of the market, dominates everything. You know, yeah. Uber Eats does a little bit. And then, of course, Uber uh, dominates rideshare. That's that's pretty much it. There's many, many other players that would like to be in there, but but nobody's nobody's in the big time where what is the landscape for india in terms of competitors with the global companies of doordash and uber yeah so in india you have at least two or three top companies in each of the segments so you have swiggy and zomato in food delivery um you know uber eats didn't really take off in india food panda also didn't take off in india and shut down uh, i actually got acquired and then you have Uber and a local competitor, Ola, going, you know, head to head uh, in the segment. But then you also have this other category of startups called 
quick delivery, which is what I want to bring back to the precarity and the risk that you spoke about, right? Where I, this is an article I wrote last year and many others have also written about this problem where the promise of 10 minute grocery delivery led to a lot of these delivery workers getting into accidents, getting tickets, driving rashly. And there was, I think, a survey or data given by one of the cities in India. The, the traffic police gave this data where the number of people jumping signals just got higher and accidents, you know, got higher because of the introduction of quick delivery services. Wow. So, you know, you have these promises of 10 minute delivery. And I remember the neighborhood I live in and I used to go for a walk at night and every uh, you know, door had this little hoarding, little board that said that, you know, 10 minute delivery and delivery and the name of the startup that was providing it. What, was that, that amount of that amount of pressure is just insane. So that's really interesting. Do you know the story about Domino's Pizza in the United States and their their uh, 30 minutes or less guarantee? Yeah, that you get pizza for free if, if it's right. And so so uh, people died, multiple people died and there was a lawsuit and a settlement that ended that uh, promotion because they found that it caused their the Domino's pizza drivers to take uh, risk. It caused the consumers to game the system and try to get something for free. So the pressure between the consumer and the and the the driver heated up. The pressure on the the, the driver particularly heated up, and people died. So. Um, that's one of the things that I really see with the gig economy as well is that there are time clocks. They're not as tight as a 30 minute guarantee, but there are time clocks, there are consequences, there are expectations. And, you know, if any, if there are any delays, you know, the, it's the worker that paid for it. Uh, if the ever, worker ever makes a mistake, they could get kicked off the platform or penalized with the contract violation in some kind of, of punitive system. So it's it's pretty insane, yeah. That that uh, the expectations can be placed on these workers, and not only that, they're traveling while that while they have a mobile device giving them directions and signals and offers and messages and notifications. It's a horribly dangerous job. I never had any real accidents or fender benders in you know 40 plus years of driving before i did the gig economy and as i say in my book i it start it was bumper cars i started doing the gig economy and you're distracted you're doing 23 24 deliveries a day every yeah. single one you're parking your car you're getting out you're doing it every time you put your car in reverse every time you pull into a parking space there is risk every single time whether somebody yeah. else is going to hit you everything else and so you know the, the risk and this is what's so deceptive about the gig economy is when when people talk about what what they earn when these when these disingenuous, fraudulent, lying gig economy companies talk about what they pay out in salaries, they don't talk about the expenses and the risk. They never talk about the expenses and they certainly never talk about the risk because that's the dirty secret. If the yeah. insurance companies and if the world really understood what the societal externalities and damage the gig economy is, economy is doing, I think people would lose their mind. Uh, we're going to learn. We're going to learn more and more. But um, as you as you said, it, it's it's really interesting how many parallels there are between your experience in India and and the experience in America of how these of how these low wage labor forces work. Um, I appreciate your time so much, and it's been such a delight to talk to you. I want to give you an opportunity to tell people uh, what type of, of work and broadcasting you do, where they can find your work and what you're working on next. Yeah, thank you so much. This has been an interesting conversation and this is something I had been working on for the last one year. So thank you for engaging with me on a topic that I love talking about. Um, I am currently, I, I am done with my fellowship. I am continuing to write about the impact of AI on gig workers, but also just labor in general. So that would not, that would include healthcare workers and other kinds of labor as well. And uh, you can find my work on varshabansal.net. That's my website. I am also on Twitter. My DMs are open, uh, happy to collaborate. So anyone who's interested in, you know, auditing any algorithm for me, please reach out. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so well, much. Uh, Varsha Bansal, it's been a delight having you. And uh, I hope we stay in touch and, and share each other's work. I'm, I'm 
certainly very interested to continue to watch uh, how you cover the gig economy and India. And this has been episode 17 of the Full Dash Closure audiobook and podcast with Varsha Bonsal. I'm Jeff Thomas Black, and thanks for watching.